Bruchem Aboim. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all to our home. Um, thank you very much for attending. We are, again, we're going to begin with the My Thought lecture. This week on My Thought will be a, a two-part lecture. Uh, again, it's, it's a very, I think it's an interesting and a topic that needs some speaking about. So the question really, what exactly was their sin? Talking about the Jews in the desert when they made the golden calf. So this week in my thoughts, I would like to examine what specifically was the sin connected with the making of the golden calf. You know, Rashi states that God was so angry with the nation that he actually threatened to destroy them all and begin a new nation that would descend from Moshe himself. The question we have to ask is, but why? What exactly was their sin? So we know Moshe went up to the mountain to receive the Torah directly from God Almighty. He had told the people before his departure that he would be gone for 40 days and 40 nights. In his count, he did not include the day that he left. However, they, the people, did include the day that he left as one of the 40 days. So when he did not return based on the day that they had calculated, well, the people were deeply concerned. He had left them and gone up to the mountain without any taking any provisions with him. So when he did not return, they thought that he may well have died on the mountain. In fact, there is a medrash that states that when he was laid to Satan, the devil, so to speak, Satan, showed the people a vision of Moshe floating in the air, laying, lying on his deathbed. Now, the people panicked. They had already experienced a direct contact with God Almighty when they received the Torah on Mount Sinai. This revelation resulted in them dying, not once, but twice. That was when they asked Moshe if he would be their intermediary, so to speak, a spokesperson between themselves and God Almighty. They felt that their corporeal bodies would not be able to withstand dying and be resurrected over and over again. So when they thought that Moshe would not return, well, they demanded an Aaron present them with someone or something that could replace Moshe as their leader, as an intermediary between themselves and God Almighty. Aaron was certain that Moshe would return shortly. And so what he did is he tried to procrastinate. He suggested to the men that they should collect from their wives golden jewelry. He told them that he would melt down the jewelry so that he would be able to fashion a, a golden calf. The calf would then act as their representative before God Almighty. Really, in reality, this was a ploy on Aaron's part, since he was felt confident that it would not be easy for the men to convince their wives to part with their jewelry, especially for the purpose of making an idol. He was right. The women refused to give any jewelry to their husbands towards, making, towards the making of the calf. We witnessed time and time again that the women of that generation were righteous. In fact, our sages tell us that those women who did not die unnaturally of old age in the desert all entered the land. However, their refusal by their wives did not deter the men at all. The verse states that they decided to donate their own golden earrings. It would seem that at this time in history, men wore earrings. Not only that, on the ring itself, they attached other gold jewelry. So to Aaron's dismay, the men quickly brought him a sufficiently large amount of gold, having no choice then. He then melted down the coal, gold and formed it into the calf. Now the gold was collected from all the men, including the Erev Rav. Uh, that was the mixed multitude. Those are the Egyptians that Moshe had brought out of Egypt. Now Moshe had made this decision of bringing them on his own without first asking God's permission. The Erev Rav felt that since Moshe had died on the mountain, they specifically needed a new leader. Somehow they were aware of the fact that they were in attendance only as Moshe's choice, but not God's. So they, more than the Jewish nation, needed a new leader, someone or something that could lead them back to Egypt. For the most part, it was they and not the Jews who served the golden calf. You know, we read that when Moshe came down from the mountain, he saw the golden calf, and in his anger, he broke the two tablets. The question we have to ask is, 
Why was he angry? Not only that, who was he angry at? The answer is that he was angry at himself. But why? First and foremost, he should have made it clear to the nation when he departed exactly when he would return. This would have eliminated any chance of error. In addition, those who actually served the golden calf were, for the most part, members of the Eruv Rav, those Egyptians that he, without consenting with God, took out of Egypt when the Jewish nation was redeemed. You know, there's another Medrash that states that Moshe complained to God, and he accused him of not showing enough compassion to his people. It seemed that the Egyptian taskmasters, in their ultimate cruelty, would take young Jewish children and they would plaster their bodies into the walls of the buildings that they were constructing. This was done if a Jewish slave failed to fill their daily quota. Well, God assured Moshe that all of those children that were plastered into the walls would not amount to anything positive. In the end, they would only cause the nation grief and sorrow. But God told Moshe that if he wanted, he had permission to remove one child that had been plastered into all in lieu of the bricks that his parents had failed to produce. Moshe then would then witness with his own eyes what that child's end would be. And so, with God's permission, Moshe took out one child who had been plastered into the wall. The child that Moshe took out of the wall was named Micha. Now the Midrash tells us that before Yosef died, he had instructed the nation that when they leave Egypt, that they should carry his coffin with them and bury his remains in the city of Shechem. So before the nation left Egypt, Moshe attempted to locate Yosef's remains. Now he was told by Sarah, who was a very old woman, who was the daughter of Asher, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, that when Yosef died, the Egyptians had placed Yosef's remains in an iron casket, and then they had submerged it into the Nile River. So now Moshe knew where Yosef's coffin was located, but he couldn't retrieve it. So in order to do so, what he did was he wrote on a golden amulet the Hebrew words, Ale Shor, Arise Ox. Well, Yosef is alluded to by the sign of an ox, the king of domesticated animals. So Moshe threw the amulet into the water of the Nile, and miraculously, Yosef's co coffin floated to the surface and then rested on the riverbank. Now, it happened that Micha, the child that Moshe had removed from the wall, was present at the time. And he was watching all that Moshe had done. So after Moshe had left with Yosef's coffin, Micha went to the edge of the river and retrieved that golden amulet, which he kept. When Aaron finished the gold, pardon me, when Aaron fashioned the golden calf, he purposely, again, took his time. He did not allow anyone else to participate in making it. After he had finished forming the calf, he threw it into the fire. Micha was there, and he threw the golden amulet that he had retrieved from the edge of the river into the fire. Now, this was the same amulet upon, Moshe, upon which Moshe had written the words, Ale Shore. Arise, ox. Much to Aaron's surprise, miraculously, the calf emerged from the fire, walking and talking. As you can imagine, the people were highly impressed. That was when the Abravrab and the lowest of the Jewish people began worshiping the calf. So Moshe was angry at himself for taking the Abravrab out of Egypt. He also realized his error in questioning God's wisdom and taking Micha, the young child, out of the wall. Had he not done these two things, it is quite possible that the whole incident of the golden calf would never have occurred at all. We read that after Moshe breaks the two tablets, he gathers, up, gathers to himself all of the members of the tribe of Levi. It seemed that not one member of that tribe had participated in the worshiping of the calf. Now, that fact was really not surprising, after all, we are told that the tribe of Levi was the only tribe that did not serve idols while they were in Egypt. In fact, they even continued to practice the rite of circumcising their newborn male babies. So the golden calf presented no real temptation for them, which was unlike the rest of the nation, those who had become steeped in idol worship, 
together with their Egyptian slave masters. As we read in the Torah where Rashi states that the sea protested to God, he wanted to drown the children of Israel together with the Egyptians. It stated, Elu ve'elu, Ovdei Avodah Zerah. They said to God that both the Egyptians and the Jewish nations were idol worshippers. So we see that prior to the children of Israel being redeemed from Egypt, they too served idols. However, once Moshe came to redeem them, they then renounced their idols and accepted the dominion of God Almighty over themselves. Now, this became an important factor in this discussion. You know, we read in the end of the portion of Beshalach that the nation of Amalek came and attacked the nation in the desert. However, we know that the children of Israel were surrounded on all sides by the clouds of glory. These clouds protected and shielded them from any and every all harm. So how could Amalek have attacked them? We read in Ma'am Lois that the tribe of Dun served an idol which was called Pesel Micha. They took this idol with them when they left Egypt. It accompanied them when they crossed the sea. They carried the idol with them when they received the Torah on Mount Sinai. They kept this idol with them during the 40 years that they journeyed in the desert, and they even brought it with them when Yoshua led them into the land. I find it interesting that the first place in the land of Israel that practiced idol worship was B'nai Brak, a city which is located in the portion of Dun. The name of this city has the same gematria, numerical value, as the word 364, as the Hebrew word hasatan, the devil. The question that comes to mind is, why was the worshipping of the golden calf any worse than the tribe of Dun worshipping their idol? For one, we really don't know exactly how many members of the tribe of Dun actually served the idol. We do know that when God told Yoshua that the nation had sinned after the battle of Jericho, Jericho, he, he investigated and he found that only one man, Ochen, out of the whole nation had actually sinned. Yet God had stated that the whole nation had sinned. A true lesson for us, that we are viewed by God Almighty as one body. If any part of your body hurts, well, all of your body hurts. The clouds of glory did not allow any idol worshipers to enter the camp of the Israelites. So those members from the tribe of Dun who did worship the idol Pesel Micha were not allowed entrance into the camp they were compelled to leave the camp and to pitch their tents outside in the open desert. That being the case, why was God so upset about those who had worshipped the golden calf? It could have been viewed as a momentary lapse. So what was it about the golden calf that was so grievous that God threatened to destroy the whole Jewish nation? God willing, next week, we will answer this question and much more. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sukkano quickly and in our time. Again, I want to thank you for attending. Hope you found this interesting. Get ready for next week. God bless you and be well. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe. Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you.